Fantastic. Thank you very much, Yala. And uh, here we are again, and let me say, uh, let me ask you to help me again to thank our wonderful eight speakers and roundtable leaders. So once again, uh, we have the opportunity now for half an hour for questions and answers. And again, thank you very much for your feeds. I'm going to start again, as per yesterday, you can have a question for a specific doctor or a, a question and leave it open to the panel to contribute. We had uh, great uh, feedback yesterday and I know we will again today. Thanks again for your feeds as well. And I see we have a question at the back of the room. I'm gonna start with one that's really representative of the feeds we got and then just like yesterday, turn it over to you. So we'll have some questions and then I wanna go through each of the, the round tables because of course you're only at one of the four and we're gonna, uh, I'm gonna be asking you to share uh, some of the thinking that you had in your round table sessions and what you got out of it. But let's start with some questions and the first one that I have is really for Dr. Little. Uh, and the question is, creating an environment that will help us address obesity and fluted can represent some very significant changes for cat owners, the way that you described all of the different things that we need to take into consideration or that we could take into consideration to help us be successful. Dr. Little, what's your experience in terms of how far the average owner is willing to go and does it really make a difference in client-owned cats in terms of inappropriate urination? Okay, that's a great question because there is a lot we can do and I think it's easy to overwhelm owners. And who's, yesterday somebody, was it Robin said about doing a data dump on owners? Robin used that? Yeah. Yeah, that's just so um, apropos. And I think we have to be really careful that we don't do that. So I uh, like to start with a good assessment of what is currently going on in their home. And there are some questionnaires and checklists available to help you do that, do an environmental resources assessment. And then I'll prioritize my recommendations for the owner so that I don't ask them to change their entire life at once. This is a lifestyle change for people. So I break it down and I say, let's tackle one thing. You want to set them up for success, right? Give them something that they can accomplish first so they get that positive feedback. And then at the next visit, we might tackle the next thing and so on. So I just encourage you to do a good um, assessment of the environment for those patients, whether it's FLUTD or whether it's obesity. Prioritize your recommendations, set your owners up for success, um, and then you know, work with them, monitor with them, and, and move forward. And I think most owners can do at least some of it. They can do at least some of it. Maybe not everything, but I'm working on it. <laughs> Thanks, Dr. Little. And I know we have a question at the back. Dr. Omar got the microphone. Hi, yeah, thanks for all the great lectures today. Two quick questions. Number one, uh, the obesity situation and FIC. Again, is that an epidemiologic thing or is there a link there? And has any studies been done showing that if cats lose weight, they are less clinical or have less relapse in FIC? That's the first part of the question. The second one is, do you guys intend on making a metabolic version of multi-care stress formula? So we'll go with the first question first, which is epidemiology surrounding obesity and fluted. Who, Iveta? <laughs> so, so the first question I will, you want me to tackle first or second? Okay, so this is wonderful comment. And what I'm gonna say that we would certainly look, look into this because if there is a need, there is opportunity for us to look into it. Uh, so I don't know if anyone of Hill's team would like to add anything. Not really? <laughs> okay. Fair enough. And your next question about uh, what Hill's might be doing, I'm going to turn it over to the back of the room to Jeff Tolsdorf. Uh, and Jeff is with Hill's. He is uh, uh, in our global marketing division and responsible for our entire portfolio of weight management related products. So I'll turn it over to Jeff. Uh, thanks, Susan. Um, I think the question was about metabolic plus urinary and adding the CD Multicare stress ingredient, if I'm correct. We are looking at that. Um, certainly we want to uh, produce uh, every possible solution that will help you. Uh, and that is certainly on our, on our radar right now. So. Thanks, Jeff. And I think there's another question. Right over here. 
Um, <clears throat> so my question is regarding antibiotic use. Uh, you know, the research is showing that so frequently this is, this is because of stress and other factors, and this isn't, you know, bacteria related. But when I, when I got out of vet school um, in Madison, I, I started working at a practice run by a, a 78-year-old doctor who, you know, give the damn cat an antibiotic. And I was it's like, actually, you know, if you look at the research, I mean, he was, he was not open to it. And so I, I was terrified, and I listened to him. And, um, you know, especially with, you know, convenia out there, I mean, it's so easy to just give a shot. And so frequently... Um, you know, I've, I've since gone to a different practice where the prices are just through the roof. I mean, if I want to culture a, a urine sample, it's $230. And um, owners are just like, they're not, they're not going for it. They're just give the cat a damn shot. And um, it works, you know, so much of the time. I give them a shot of antibiotic and it works. And why is it working if it's not bacteria related? <laughs> They're, they're fighting over who gets to answer your question. I guess I'll see. Okay. <laughs> How much time do we have? I take your point. Those are really good points. So, you know, here's the first thing I say. You know those 78-year-old vets who just say, they'll die eventually. <laughs> it's always my answer. Sorry. Canadian, we're a little blunt. They'll die. Just wait, they'll die. You know, things change. Why does it look like it works? It's because most episodes of FIC last three to five days. If you prayed to the moon, if you burned incense, if you did a dance every Wednesday morning, if you gave antibiotics, they will get better. That's why. It doesn't matter what you do, they're going to get better within a week. So that's why so many practitioners feel like it works. I, you're right. So, and so here's point number two. Be a veterinarian, right? Be a veterinarian. Be the scientist. Be the one who says, I know this is not the right thing to do. And remember, people, there, it's not like giving an antibiotic when you don't need it is, is free of side effects. There is a huge downside to inappropriate use of antibiotics. And we are, uh, need to play just as much a responsible role in that as human physicians do. So it's not appropriate. You know it's not appropriate, right? Okay, so here's my third thing I'm going to say to you, and then somebody else can comment. Um, so when you get the cat that comes in with lower urinary tract signs, and you say, yeah, so it costs a lot of money to do urine culture, that's not where I would spend the client's money. You, I would not spend the client's money on something that has less, of, less than a 5% chance uh, of being the correct diagnostic test. So I see owners all the time that only have so much money for that cat with lower urinary tract signs. And if I have a budget, what am I going to spend? I'm going to do a radiograph. That's what I'm going to do, right? Because there's no specific test for FIC. What's the next most likely thing? It's urolis. Do I have a test for that? Yes, I'm going to spend their money. I won't even do a UA, okay? There's some heresy for you. If I only have, if, I, if, if the owner says, I have X number of dollars, doc, spend it wisely, I'm going to spend it on a radiograph first. Right? And then if I have more money, I'll move on to the UA. But that's how I think about it. Um, go to a talk by Jody Lulich. She'll change your life. <laughs> Dr. Little, don't hold back. Tell us how you really feel next time. <laughs> I have a... Well, did you want to say more about it? I'm really sorry, but I don't want questions to be unanswered, and I feel like we didn't answer your question on FIC and obesity link, so I don't know if anyone wants to on the epidemiology. I will just add one thing. So I have looked into this relationship. And in fact, what is going on in the lining of urinary bladder is something what is called neurogenic inflammation. And during the neurogenic inflammation, you have a lot of pro-inflammatory neuropeptides released. We know this actually in women and in cats. And the, the way they do the damage to the tissue is that they use reactive oxygen species generation to damage the tissues. If you think about obesity, there is a lot of reactive oxygen species generated in the adipose tissue. So there actually might be a link between reactive oxygen species and oxidative stress induced by adiposity, putting another load of oxidative stress on all tissues, including the bladder. And I think this is the area that needs more investigation and perhaps research in the feline medicine. And I will allow anyone else to comment on that. But that was a very good question. Thank you for that. Thanks very much. That was a 
a really good addition to that question. Uh, I have another question actually specific, specifically for you, Dr. Bekarova, um, uh, and this came in from the feed. Uh, first of all, thank you for your presentation. Uh, and in your study, 83% of cats lost weight. Um, can you please comment on the other 17% and how do I translate that into real life in my practice? If I'm going to use this product and I know those data, what do I tell my clients? Well, thank you for this question. Did you know that in biology, <laughs> nothing is ever 100%? <laughs> it's not different in this study. If we do any clinical trials, nothing ever comes out 100%, and when it does, it's very suspicious <laughs> something went wrong. So it is normal reality that some of your patients are not going to respond. Uh, specifically for this study, the, there were 17% of cats who actually uh, did not lose weight or gained weight. Numerically, there were 16 cats who gained weight and six cats who didn't change in a weight over the period of the study. And those 16 cats which gained weight gained 2.6% of the body weight. And statistically, we did statistic on it, and it was not different from the baseline while the weight loss was. So yes, it is a failure, and it is uh, inherent to our clinical trials we do. And when that happens, then I go back to square one. I do nutritional assessment question, questioning again. I'm trying to find out what's going on, if I can, with open-ended questions to figure out what, what might be, what the problem might be. And I'm trying to look back to the patient, to the amount of food I'm feeding, what is the feeding management, can I change something, maybe one thing in a time, one thing in a time, don't ask them to change five things in a time, is the way to go. You should decrease the, the number of calories you're feeding by 10% to start with, and see maybe it's just few, you're only a few kibbles away from the amount of calories to start seeing good weight loss plan. So it is, a, it is an answer, and I believe someone else would like to add something to that. Dr. Brady just has an additional comment, and then we're going to go on. I want to make sure we have time for you to share your experiences in the breakout. I just wanted to share a personal story. So I have two cats that are on metabolic, and what we noticed was that they were both gaining weight. And my wife's a veterinarian. I work at Hills. I manage the veterinary consultation service, so what is going on? We have automatic feeders. We weigh out the food. We put it in the feeders. And it wasn't until we went on vacation and one of my technician friends watched our cats and he says, do you realize that your cats know how to trick the feeder? <laughs> and, and, and so he got, so as Susan said, taking pictures, we, we have a video and the cats push the drawer open and they free choice feed whenever they want. So it... it, it Cats are very smart. It, it doesn't always have to be complicated. It, it doesn't always have to be that the client is not telling you the truth. Sometimes it's, it's just simple things that, that you, would not, you would not think. But cats are incredibly smart, and if they want to eat more food, they'll figure a way to do it. Thanks a lot, Dr. Brady. I love it when, well, and Dr. Little started us off by, you know, bearing her soul and showing us her fat cats and it's great to have uh, real life stories because it happens to all of us, not just our clients and even to Hills veterinarians. So uh, I want to get to the breakouts. As you know, of course, you all divided up into different groups and I'm going to start by asking each of the leaders of the breakout to in one sentence describe what their breakout was about so the whole room uh, is informed about what the topic was and then I'll, I'll ask you to share some thoughts from it. I'm going to start with Dr. Dana Hutchinson. Uh, Dana, can you please, your topic was nutritional management of the cachexic feline renal patient. Thank you. So that title was pretty thorough. <laughs> this was a case-based session addressing that typical cachectic chronic kidney disease cat 
and looking at optimal management for those cats using an evidence-based approach. And that was the key, was that it was an evidence-based review using a case scenario to go through it. So um, that, that pretty much sums that up. Thanks, Dr. Hutchinson. And for those of you that were in Dr. Hutchinson's group, you know who you are. Um, think about and please um, offer up either during that session when you were in your small group tables and talking amongst yourselves, either what light bulb came on for you or based on the, on the case that you reviewed and your chat amongst yourselves as colleagues, is there anything that you came away that you are considering changing or doing differently when you get back into practice based either on what you learned from the case or again in your conversation amongst yourselves? So I need, oh, right there, microphone is coming. Thank you. So our small group really talked about um, some of the dissenters and um, people are feeling like maybe we should be feeding a higher protein diet to these cats. Um, and it, it really brought it home that it, there is no evidence to support that and KD is, is well supported with great studies. And so I will continue to feed KD and not, not look for a different diet. Thank you. Um, one here. It's me again. <laughs> so, no antibiotics, right? <laughs> so I've solely been treating uh, renal disease with antibiotics. And I... <laughs> I kid, I kid, I kid. So, <laughs> you know, I, I think the interesting thing that came out of this for, for our group was the word sarcopenia. We saw sarcopenia and it was like, it sounded like the bad guy from a movie. Um, <laughs> And it was this idea that you can have muscle wasting um, in the absence of disease. You know, so often we get these cats that come in that are emaciated and we think, you know, he's got renal disease or he's got diabetes or he's got hyperthyroidism and we do a workup or maybe IBD. And occasionally, nothing, you know. And I'm, I'm guilty of telling the client, like, listen, I know exactly what is wrong with your cat. It's one of four things. And um, sometimes it's not. It's sarcopenia, which is just this, this uh, age-related muscle wasting in the absence of disease. So I'm not going to change anything. I'm going to keep going with the antibiotics. But um, I <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Our next, uh, uh, Dr. Downing, if you can make a quick. Well worth it. Thank you, Dr. Downing. The uh, second... Um, Dr. Uh, Jones, we want her to repeat. Sorry? Oh. Sorry. I tried to make it quick, really, Dr. Jones, I did. In our group, what we, what we really concluded was that this whole high protein, low protein thing is a moot point, that it's our obligation to step up, be the doctor, and educate our clients that it's about high digestibility protein, high quality protein, what is bioavailable to the pet, that we need to remember that we need a higher caloric density because many of these cats are volume limited as to how much they will eat, and that what does that do? That drills us back to be a doctor, make a prescription, communicate effectively with the client, make an effective recommendation, and provide um, a, appropriate and effective education of that client to help them sort through the hoo-ha that's out there with uh, marketing pieces that mean nothing when we, what we really need to do is follow the data. Thank you. Thank you. Well worth repeating and I'm glad you pointed that out so we could make sure everybody had a chance to hear. Another breakout session that we had was led by Dr. Paul Cleland and the topic was nutrition for managing atopic dermatitis. Dr. Cleland, can you tell us a little bit about your session? Certainly, you spent the entire symposium having us tell you things, and so my breakout session was having you tell us things, and we had a wonderful discussion and great feedback on what you desire when it comes to nutrition for atopic dermatitis. Thank you very much, Dr. Cleland. And so for those of you that were working with Dr. Cleland and, and putting forward your ideas, 
let me know what were some of the hot buttons, what did you have to say about what you need for atopic dermatitis, whatever comes to mind from being in that session. Help us understand some of the conversation that went on. One there and then one here. Thank you, Bianca. Um, one of the things um, that was touched upon is how helpful um, the, not necessarily just going straight to um, the dermatologic diets, DD or ZD, but when you have mild or moderate atopic dermatitis, how much just a really good nutrition that has um, loads of omega fatty acids and other sort of skin support um, can help with those patients. And in particular, JD being used a lot in dermatology clinics um, and, uh, and then I'm excited about JD plus metabolic being used for dermatitis when you have mild to moderate um, skin issues in overweight patients as well. So they get loads and loads and loads of these fatty acids. They don't have to worry about trying to supplement the diet or doing a novel protein necessarily, um, and they can get really great results from those things. So that was something that came from our discussion that I found very helpful. Thank you very much. And another comment here? We did talk a lot about diets in general, but things that we're hoping Hills can maybe come out with in the future um, is new novel proteins, like actual proteins themselves. Um, you know, unfortunately, everybody's, you know, nature's varieties, nature's best, the bane of my existence, blue buffalo is horrific, but they all have, you know, the venison, the rabbit, um, salmon, different things like that. So we're kind of running out of options because they've already been on all those things. So maybe even like, you know, rats from New York City, um, you know, the sharks, kangaroos, whatever. Um, and then even if they could make that hydrolyzed too, so that way you're getting best of both, both worlds because that was also another topic. Do you go for the novel protein or do you go for the hydrolyzed? And there was a, pretty much a split at least at my table about that. Thank you very much. Our third breakout session was led by Dr. Mark Brady with the intriguing title, Dilution is Not Always a Solution. So I'll ask Dr. Brady to share with those of you that were not in his group what his uh, breakout group was about. We played with Play-Doh <laughs> and pipe cleaners and all sorts of toys. So I know the, the people that didn't attend our breakout session are really bummed right now. So, um, but I, I would, I would, um, piggyback on what Paul said. Our, our breakout session was the same, that we've, we've told you for a day and a half uh, in, different, in different lectures kind of what to think, and so we really wanted to try to gather your insights as to what, what you thought, so hopefully everyone had fun doing it. Thanks, Dr. Brady. And so tell me, uh, what happened in, in your roundtable, in your break, breakout groups? What thoughts came to mind, maybe from something a colleague shared, or whatever you were talking about, uh, what were the key things? We we're talking about um, canine uh, urinary tract disease. What did you go away thinking? What's top of mind? What did you, what light bulb came on or did you think about doing differently? Or something that was perhaps reconfirmed for you? What are you thinking about now in terms of canine lower urinary tract disease in terms, from having been in that breakout? Anybody from Dr. Brady's group? <laughs> any thoughts about w anything that was new for you or reconfirmed for you? Pardon me? Okay, Dr. Drew Forrester is going to get us started. <laughs> no, I'm just going to give it. So one thing at our table that came up was, uh, I think not, not anything new. So we talked about the new CD Multicure Canine. If you're not aware, it's a new brand new product that you'll be having very soon to use for your dogs, just like you've had to use for cats in the past. And um, the, the key takeaway from my small group was that it's a lifestyle change, and that's the piece of you making that recommendation. You have to make a passionate recommendation. And sometimes when we, when we talk about food, we simply kind of consider it as, oh, yeah, and then there's food. Food needs to be critical, central. It's a very important part of your recommendation for your patients. So always think about food, and it's, it's really a culture change, and that's what came out from my group. Thanks a lot, Dr. Forrester. Anything else on that? And don't think that we're asking you to say something nice about Hill's food. 
anything about that disease or managing it or thoughts that came out from having that chance to discuss with your colleagues in that group. Then our fourth breakout session was led by my friend Arnaud Brell from Hills. And his, the title of his was Transforming Lives Through the Hills Food, Shelter and Love Program. So Arnaud, would you tell us a little more about your breakout? Good morning, everybody. Um, I am Arnaud Brel, and um, I am the Associate Director for Science Date Marketing. And um, we were extremely fortunate to have three very experienced uh, shelter veterinarians with us uh, today uh, from two of the leading shelters um, in the country. Uh, from Denver Dumfries League, we had uh, Dr. Casey Carter, and from uh, San Diego Humane Society, we had uh, Dr. Cindy Mitchell and Dr. Leslie Sklina. And um, basically, they, they really shared with us how every day, um, veterinarians and shelters work together to transform the lives uh, of homeless pets. And um, we, we got some really great insights um, on, for instance, on the internship opportunities that now exist for, you know, um, veterinary college students uh, with um, shelters. Um, some great insights on um, how San Diego now is able to save over 1,800 kitten lives every year that would have had such, you know, negative prospects some years ago. So it was very, um, you know, very exciting to hear that. And um, I would say this is why as well at Hills we, we really feel that the Hills Food, Shelter and Love um, is really a great fit with what veterinarians and shelters do every day to transform these lives. Thanks very much, Arnaud. And this topic, of course, was different than the others and that we're not, we weren't focusing on some disease condition and some Hills product. I'm interested for those of you that attended, and it was great that we had those guests there. What kind of thoughts came to mind for you? What occurred to you that maybe you haven't thought about before? Or um, just what, uh, what's top of mind for you having had that experience? Thanks. I didn't actually attend the session, but I've been hanging out with the shelter vets this weekend and I just think it would be great if Hills publicized this program more because I personally just know about the Purina feeding program from their mass media and the cute puppy faces behind the kennel doors and this is something that would really benefit Hills to publicize because everybody thinks this Hills as the corn food and this would be something that is just publicly gets your name out there and has a better perspective so just a recommendation. Thank you very much. We really appreciate your feedback and your recommendation. Any other thoughts that you had about, about that or in that session, and it doesn't have to be again about Hills or their program, any thoughts that you want to share that, that you had personally about as veterinarians and animal lovers that are here to transform lives? Any thoughts that you want to share? Yes, thank you. Thank you. So we got some great insights from two of the shelters and what impressed me most, not coming from the United States, was that these shelters um, are not just pieces put together by people that want to do good to animals, but um, they are doing a really professional job and they are having a strategy. So it's really getting to a professional level and that's what's making it so powerful. So that is something that impressed me a lot and that I definitely want to take back to Europe. Well done. Thank you. Yes, it's an insight into a world that mo many of us don't know very much about. Um, thank you, Alexandra. And I will, I will uh, build on, up on your comment because um, actually um, Dr. Cindy Mitchell was very vocal about inviting you as well to reach out to your local shelter and just experience how the field of shelter and animal sheltering has really changed over the last years. And what you know, was referred 10, 15 years ago uh, as you know, the dog pound has now really become an extremely pro professional organization who is extremely committed at, you know, um, sharing, sharing this new adoption and these new customers with you. Um, it, it was very obvious from these two shelters how at the time of adoption they share, um, you know, the, the work that has been done in terms of veterinary medicine with, the, with, the, with these patients and invite them to visit their local veterinarians. So I would, I would really invite you to um, to visit your local shelters and, 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 and experience that transformation as well. Thank you, Arnaud. And uh, once again, I want to thank our eight speakers and breakout leaders today um, and ask them to return to their seats. But thank you again for sharing your expertise with us today.